Merhaba, um, yeah. welcome and good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have Einar here with us today. Uh, Einar has a company in Denmark called Nordic Playground Institute. Uh, and we have been touring a little bit yesterday and today Istanbul with him to understand the level of safety of playgrounds in Istanbul. Uh, but Aina is also here to talk about safety and play, not only safety, right? So we, uh, Aina is very interested in figuring out how we can have safe play. And that's also why we want to have this discussion with you here today, this afternoon. But I would leave the, the floor to Aina. Okay, yeah, so Aina is, is here is a, I think fourth or fifth speaker within the Istanbul 95 talks. We have had uh, several other speakers kind of exploring with us uh, what it means to have uh, cities that are safe for children to, to grow up in. Uh, and of course, it's the city itself, but it's also a playground. So today we are more focused on the playground. Uh, other talks have been more about the city and it's accessible for children. Okay, so there was one more request. Uh, hi, um, Greg, um, I now requested that I kind of ask him questions along we go along the presentation, so um, I, I will be, because the whole, st we had five days with him in uh, Copenhagen in February, uh, where we went through the 1176, the, the standards, so, um, which is a 250 page document, uh, and we won't go through the whole 250 pages here, but kind of trying to figure out what would be relevant for designers to know, and what is interesting for parks and gardens uh, teams within municipalities to know. So I'll be kind of guiding the conversation a little bit through questions. So here we go. We're not turning this on, are we? It's on. Oh, we are? <laughs> Am I doing okay to look at me? I think it's okay. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's me. My name is Einar. I was born in Iceland. I grew up on the Faroe Islands. Anyone knows where the Faroe Islands are? 18 itty bitty islands in the Atlantic? Anyone? No one? Great. <laughs> they threw off all the seasick Vikings on the way to Iceland. So, all, a lot of seasick Vikings in the Faroe Islands. I, um, I was seven years in the army, so when I speak about children falling and breaking arms and legs, that's why. Um, I'm the CEO of the Nordic Playground Indu uh, Institute in Denmark. We do um, product certification for the playground industry, but also parkour and multi-sports and skating ramps and activity areas and fitness, outdoor fitness. Uh, and we do inspections of those as well. And we do training of new inspectors. But our entire philosophy into the playground safety area, if you can call it that, is we want the development of children's motor skills first. That's our first concern. After that, we think about safety. Because today, the European standards have been in, in effect since 1990, 1998. So they've been around. We know why they're there. We know what's in them. So motor skills development first, and then regular safety, okay? And when we go along, remember, this is not rocket science, and it's not brain surgery, okay? This is logic put onto paper. Children's motor skills development often occurs on the cost of a broken leg or a broken arm. I translate that into, it's okay for children to fall, break both legs, both arms, a nose, and lose all their teeth. You know why? Because it doesn't kill them. So it's fine. So when we talk about playground safety, we're not talking about no broken bones, no broken arms, no splinters. We're talking about death and serious bodily harm and injury. Okay? It's okay to fall. And this is the opening paragraph of the code. This is the introduction to the European standard. Okay? So our responsibility is not to remove all risk. It's to manage the risk. To be able to ensure some sort of 
uh, motor skills development, especially in the young children. Because all of the studies show that if we challenge children from the age of one until the age of six or seven, that will have a tremendous effect on how active they will be growing up and how active they will be as adults. Plus, children's uh, basic motor skills can be trained and can be developed from an early age, which is why we should never ever carry our babies, or, or the babies we can carry. <laughs> we, car we shouldn't carry our toddlers. If they can walk, let them walk. Nothing happens if they fall. Yeah, they will cry, boo-hoo. Then we pick them up and let them walk until they fall, and then they pick themselves up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. The biggest problem for toddlers today, children from one to three, is that they can't walk across a floor unless it's totally clean and even. They they don't lift their feet. They have no feet to eye coordination at all, because they get carried from the car into the kindergarten. They get carried from the front door of the kindergarten into the f onto the floor where they play. At 10 o'clock, they get carried onto a chair where they eat, and then they get carried. You're following me, right? Yeah. No carrying of the, of the toddlers. Yeah. Plus, to deny access as a safety measure is problematic. So we have to let them on to the playgrounds. We have to let them on the equipment which is why the standard today differentiates between easily accessible equipment and not easily accessible. And we'll be showing you some pictures where you think, yeah, that's not easy, easily accessible, but they're two different things, okay? Plus, risk-taking is an essential element in all play and is meant to help children to handle risks in a controlled environment. That is our responsibility as adults, not as playground designers or installers or manufacturers, as adults. How many mothers have you seen standing behind their children while they're climbing somewhere going like this? Or, or fathers trying to help their boys up a tree or somewhere? Let them climb, let them fall, they'll be fine. If everything was so dangerous, all of you would be dead. Okay? So I don't know how this works, that one. Talking about being challenged. <laughs> he doesn't stop. That is not wrong. A broken arm is better than a broken spirit. Does that look dangerous? Playing in the woods? How many of you grew up with woods, I mean with trees around? How many of you grew up in the city? Why aren't all of you dead? <laughs> if everything's so dangerous. Okay, moving on to... Um, I guess we're gonna do kind of a conversation around standard equipment and things that are non-standard and see, can we design actually, because here one of the challenges is that the producers have a hard time taking design challenges on. So when you're a designer, it becomes a difficult thing to design something that's not standard. Maybe there's nothing wrong with that. But 
um, I think some of the learning from you, Aina, is uh, for this room, is that things could look like that and they conform to safety requirements, but then things can look different as well. Both are safe. Which one is more challenging? Which one gives small children more, or children in, in general, more motor skills challenges and development? Definitely not that one. So you can, as a designer, you can design whatever you want. Do that first. Do the challenging of children first. Then think about safety later. Just do the safety issue before you sell it and install it. So the, the difference between that one and this one is they're both safe, they're both fine, they can both be certified, but one is more challenging than the other. And I can guarantee you one is also more expensive than the other. A little bit more expensive. A little bit more expensive, yeah. At least a little bit more expensive. If you take this playground, put it in a park somewhere, ask 10 children if that one is dangerous, yes or no. Nine out of 10 will say, yes, it is. I would say that it isn't. Because the difference between easily accessible and not easily accessible is that if it's easily accessible, we have access for children under the age of three. And there are some ways that we can make equipment easily accessible. If we have a ramp starting from the ground, going up with an inclination under 38 degrees, then it's easily accessible. If we have stairs like these, it's easily accessible. If we have a ladder where the lowest step is lower than 40 centimeters off the ground, then it's easily accessible. Or if the lowest platform they can reach is lower than 60, because then they can put their body on top and then pull themselves in. Okay? Any questions so far? We're going to be here for the next eight hours, so you might as well start. Okay, so this looks dangerous, but isn't. That's a normal slide, certified, fine, wonderful, approved, safe, until it's been on the playground for a couple of years. Then the gaps open. This is the testing probe of a child's finger. Finger entrapments are not allowed where they are the object of a forced movement. So on a swing or slide or carousel or cableways. That's the toggle test, the <laughs> strangulation. Also certified, nice slide. This one, certified, wonderful, nice, beautiful, stainless steel. Maintenance free. But if a small child slides off here and goes into the sand, they will hit their head on, on the slide because the distance from the top of the slide here down to the sand is too great. So this is an installment issue. Even though the slide's fine, the slide's certified and everything, the installment uh, people made a mistake. It's too high off the ground. Okay, and over here, this is an old slide, way too steep. They, <laughs> they go flying off here, like re really flying. Can children perceive these? What, no, because it's a, it's a yellow and bright or orange or red slide, yay, looks safe, but they're not. And the other one, looked dangerous but was safe so they can't they can't see that in advance 
so they can't do their own risk assessment before they start using the equipment. Okay, that's our responsibility. That's what we need to do. And there we have the, the toggle test again in the playhouse. Also good woodwork, except for the last beam put on top of the roof. Because children climb the roofs. That's what they do. We have grown up designing playgrounds. We have grown up designing equipment. A grown up sits at his desk, designs a piece of equipment and thinks the children are gonna use it like this, this, or this. Then we put it in a park, let a hundred kids use it, and they find 11 more ways to use it. We know they climb the, the, the roofs of the playhouses, which is why we are required as inspectors by the European standards to toggle test all the roofs and the end of the roof as well. Okay? So once again, here we are not nervous about the child falling from the roof. We don't care that he can fall. Why don't we care? Because they, it won't kill them. But that will kill them. But the, the second to, no. <laughs> Until Saturday, the third to last death we had in Denmark was uh, one of those toggle strangulations. A three-year-old. What, what, what happens? He climbed on top of one of the playhouses and got stuck. And uh, the people looking out for him, they just went inside to help some of the other kids. And when they came back, they couldn't find him. And they started looking for him and found him 15 minutes later, hanging on the back of the house. It's ugly. It's not pretty. So, but remember, that's the worst case scenario. That's if they die, which is why we rather break an arm than a spirit, okay? Yeah? How does it's just, um, can you show the, it's just a chain with a, with a button at the end. And everywhere that they are the object of a forced movement, we test with this one. It's just a chain with a button at the end. Easy peasy, 40 centimeters, that's it. Because this is this is for enclothing entanglement for clothes, yeah, so they don't they don't get stuck. So it's mostly the hoodies, actually, no, or the. Well, uh, you or if, if you if you <laughs> if you ask some of the people taking care of children in Denmark if they have st uh, straps or leave or anything, and they're, they're no no no no no they're not allowed and yada yada. But still, a, a boy got hung, even though he didn't have the. He got hung in his, in, uh, he put the, the, the flight suit, what's it called? It was a one piece in, in winter. Jump. Yeah, jumpsuit, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he got stuck. And the, the it was uh, closed up here and he got stuck. That was it. And he, they can't lift themselves up. That's the problem. But I'm not, I'm not a safety fanatic. I mean, we have, we have, we have high speed regular access to our emergency room because I have three kids. So I'm not a fanatic safety uh, wise. Plus these ones and that one, the children can't see it. That is the body going through a barrier where the head can't follow. And we have the body probe here. I will now show you the ugliest kid alive or dead. This is the hips of a child. This is the average hip on a zero to 14 year old in Europe. This is based on empirical data. Okay. This is the biggest head of a zero to 14 year old kid in Europe based on empirical data. Okay. That's what, that's what I told you. This is the ugliest kid alive. But if the body can pass, and they can't support their weight on the other side, and the head can't, then what happens? They get hung because they can't lift their own weight when they're small.
So this one can pass. This one has to follow. But maybe here, I don't know if we that hole is, it's not a playground, but maybe we can check. This isn't, ah, it doesn't pass. Okay. but the steps are. This can go between the steps, and this one cannot follow. Actually, we saw a ladder today designed for a, a slide yeah. that had all kinds of head entrapment issues. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in some ways, it's really not about the, the big idea in the design. And it's actually in these details that the code is, uh, is, is gives really good rules on how to avoid accidents. Because you can design something that looks super challenging, yeah. and it is challenging. But it can also be super safe, even though it's super challenging. So the standard isn't that much of a, of a hindrance for as a, or for the design view of it. That's why I always tell people, design your super challenging playground first, and then do the safe one afterwards. OK? Any question? Yep. Well, yeah, because um, the standards the standard says that, that materials should be, well, they're allowed to be flammable. I mean, they can burn, but they're not allowed to have an explosive um, combustion. Yeah, combustion. They, they're not allowed to, to go <laughs> And no, I've, okay, I've, uh, the first time I heard about this was yesterday, static electricity. Anyone heard about this? <laughs> You're, I it's, it's a regular problem in Istanbul? Seriously? <laughs> Never ever heard about static electricity on playgrounds in in the world. I'm a <laughs> seriously, I'm a Europ I'm a European certified inspector and I'm also an uh, American certified inspector. I know all the rules in the world. I've never ever and I'm in every single network that exists on the face of the planet. I've never heard of static electricity. <laughs> we have to we have to contribute. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> that's our contribution to, yeah, <laughs> to that's this that discussion. That's the, the Turkish contribution to the standard work. <laughs> but it, if, if it is a problem, it is something that should be addressed. So no plastic slides, please. Do fiberglass or stainless steel. Static electricity. <laughs> I'm also, by the way, I'm also a licensed electrician. So <laughs> I've never heard about static electricity. That's awesome. I have to go. I have to go to Istanbul to learn something new. That's fine. <laughs> Here we have two different playgrounds. Two different means of access. The one on the left is a what? Easily accessible. Why is the one on the left easily accessible? because it has a ladder where the lowest step is lower than, or the first step is lower than 40 centimeters off the ground. So here we need to think about young children. When y they are on there, what, what do we need to worry about because it's easily yeah. accessible? Yeah, as soon as we have a piece of equipment that is easily accessible, as soon as we have that, we have to consider the falling height because as soon as the falling height exceeds 60 centimeters, we need something soft to fall on within one meter 50. And we need a barrier to make sure that they don't fall on the soft one meter 50 area we just used money on. So we, need, we both need the impact attenuating surfacing plus a barrier. Above 60 on easy accessible. Above 60 on easily accessible equipment. If we remove the first step, we can go all the way up to two meters before we need a barrier. But from one meter, we need a guardrail. But all equipment, if it's easily accessible or not, needs impact attenuating surfacing. Mean it needs something soft to land on from 60 centimeters falling height. And below 60? And below 60, 
they are allowed to fall on asphalt, concrete, and rocks. Okay? Because they don't, they don't reach um, maximum falling speed below 60. But even though we have a piece of equipment with a falling height lower than 60, we still need to give them a room to fall in. So they need one meter and 50 centimeter, one and a half meter. They need a falling space. And they're not allowed to hit anything on the way down. So they can fall and hit asphalt or concrete, but they need the opportunity to fall all the way freely. Okay? Can you imagine if, if you're standing somewhere and your feet lock and you start falling and then halfway down your head hits something? One, you hit your head, boo-hoo, but your body keeps falling. Then what happens to your neck? Your neck goes, done, lights out, you're not going home. We've seen it. It's not a joke, which is why even though it's low and does is not dangerous or anything, we need to give them the opportunity to fall all the way without hitting anything on the way down. Okay? So at least one and a half meter of falling space around everything. The reason I go everything is because it's not everything. A playhouse and a sandbox does not have a falling space because the intended play is inside the box or inside or around the house. Even though we toggle test the roof, it's not intended for play on the roof. But we know they go up there. Okay? So sandboxes and playhouses do not generate a falling space. So they can be put close to each other or a playhouse inside a big sandbox. That's fine. We didn't talk about the other image. <sighs> we can do this. So we have easily accessible and the other one is not. The other one is not easily accessible because there are no stairs, there are no ladders, and there's no ramp. And the point of this mouth, when we measured it in their workshop, was 64 centimeters. So this is not easily accessible, even though Kids are <laughs> up there. They're going inside the whale and outside the uh, out through the blowhole. Yeah. So this is not easily accessible. And they will climb on the outside of this. So we toggle test all of these rooms. Okay? Perfect. It's never perfect. Okay, here we have the Russian bear. Well, it's, it's in Denmark, so it could be a Danish bear, but we don't have bears. <laughs> and there's also a dragon, as you can see. This one is unclimbable on the outside. It's defined as unclimbable on the outside. It is not easily accessible because the first step is above 40 centimeters off the ground. So it is not easily accessible. Children are allowed to fall from three meters all the way down to the ground. Three meters. Can you imagine just falling backwards and landing on your shoulders, what your lungs do? They go boop. Try to imagine falling three meters and landing on your back. Your lungs go poof. Your lungs collapse. But they're just kids, they'll be fine. Even, even the small kids, or especially the small kids, they are fine. And the younger the kids, the fewer broken bones. Because between the age of one to three, they fall like a bag of potatoes. They don't try to, to catch themselves. They just fall <laughs> like drunken sailors or, I don't know, like drunken men primarily. 
So it's first when they are about four or five, they start breaking arms and legs because they try to catch themselves because they, then they get uh, scared. Small children have no fear. They will try anything once. They'll jump down the stairs even though they have no idea how to land or how to do anything. And then they'll tumble all the way down, cry for two or three hours, and then they're fine. If I did that, I'd kill myself, probably. So when they fall, they rarely break anything when they're small. This one, however, is way higher than three meters, which is why it's closed. And when you walk on the inside, you go from one platform to another all the way around. And the platforms are lower than 60 from each other. So if we put a step, one more step down here, the entire bear would be easily accessible. But because they removed the lowest step, or the first step, it is now not, easy, not uh, easily accessible. Yeah? So it targets uh, older kids? Yeah. Okay. Above the age of three. Yeah. Okay. I was just saying, <laughs> yeah. Is it written in somewhere, or it's just a rule between play playgrounders? No, no, no, it's, it's in the standard. It's in the standard. Yeah, the standard says easily accessible and up. Oh, you're thinking about the, the, the three-year and, and up? Yeah, for example, is there any uh, signature that uh, um, no one can use this playground uh, who is under three? No. No, but because we understand because of the first step. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and that's the only reason. In, in America, you have to put a sign up saying which age group this okay. playground is for. Then it's possible or not, because if, if the three-year-old is actually a capable three-year-old... Yep, he'll be fine. He'll be fine, he can yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it gives enough time to uh, caregivers, adults, mm. to notice, because he's... He has to work more to get in than his older brother. He'll just poop, poop, poop, and then he's in. But it gives the adults more time to intervene. Well, yeah, and it's, it's, I think it's primarily about the competencies and skill set of the kids trying. Because I would never, ever say no to any of my kids, even though I know all the rules. I would never, ever say, no, you cannot play up there because it's for older kids and it's not easily accessible. Our middle child has broken every single bone in his body except this one, I think, and maybe this one. He's broken everything, like both arms, both legs, ribs, you name it. It was so bad that the doctors at the hospital he came to started asking him questions about how much I drink and if I ever, if I ever hit my wife and if I hit the kids. That's what they're supposed to do in, in, in Denmark. And that was fine, was fine, yeah. <laughs> and that's because, that's because when he got born, his older brother was three years old. So when he learned to walk, his older brother was four, and his older brother could do all kinds of things, and he wanted to do them as well. For instance, jump down the stairs. That did not go well. Broken arm, two ribs, babu babu. And then we came back three weeks later on a trampoline, kapoof, somewhere, yeah. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt and all the stamps from the hospital, awesome. But, so, but you wouldn't say, no, you can't do it. I will never, ever say no. He's an awesome, he's, a, he's, he's turning 14 on the 11th of May. He's an awesome kid. And there's almost nothing wrong with him. <laughs> well, not, not any more than his <laughs> fatherly image. So that's why in the standard it, it also says that denying access, denying access as a mean of risk management is wrong. We Can you translate that to English? But we shouldn't say no just because we think that it's dangerous. If they think they can manage, let them. And keep an eye on them. If you think it's dangerous, keep an eye on them. Don't lift them up. Don't help them. Let them do it themselves. 
in Denmark, we have a big issue about uh, all the, the trees and the kindergartens and, the, and the, the preschool area and everything. Oh, they can climb the trees. Yes, they can. So what? I grew up in a country without trees, so <laughs> I'm fine. But we let them climb the trees. If they can, let them. Yeah, but then they can fall. Yes, they can. And so what? It's not rocket science. It's not brain surgery. It's logic. Let them. If, if we want to have healthy, if we want to have healthy, well-functioning teenagers who don't walk into traffic because there's no barrier on the sidewalk, we need to let them challenge themselves between the age of one and four. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, a toddler fall into the uh, four meter um, water. A pipe. well. Yeah. Yeah. Then the mother followed uh, him. She broke all, all her uh, all of her, her uh, bones, but uh, the children was super fine. Yeah. Uh, so, do you have a limit for this uh, for the potato example? Is is there a doctor in the house? No doctor. It depends on when their their um, skeleton calcifies. Mm -hmm. So it's it's earlier for for girls than it is for boys. Plus, a, a boy can't uh, uh, distinguish between morally correct and morally incorrect, and ethical and unethical before we're 23 to 25, because our frontal lobes aren't. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a it's a fact, because our frontal, lo which is why young men are stupid, because our frontal lobes haven't grown grown together, which is our moral center. So it, it depends, but I would say between after four, five maybe, then they start. It becomes risky. Yeah, it, be yeah, it becomes. Okay. But even, even if, it ris if it's risky, it's fine. No, no, no, no, no, no, no, no, no. Yes, but it's yeah. just, okay. Yeah. But the kid is, the kid's fine? Kid is super fine. Yeah. No one broken bones and at all. And mommy's broken? Everywhere. It, it happened in a park. And the mommy wasn't a drunk sailor? Or no, okay. no, no. He w she was just following yeah. uh, her <laughs> children. Yeah. Yeah. So it can happen to anyone. Looks dangerous. Yeah, especially in the dark. In the dark, there are lights up here. And in the mouth, they were uh, talking about putting a smoke machine in it. Let smoke come out of the ears and out of the mouth. I don't know if they did, they did that yet. Not easily accessible, but could easily have been made easily accessible. Depends on the client. What do they want? <coughs> do we want small children to play on this playground? Yes or no? Or do we only want it for the older kids? So it depends. This is not a standardized piece of equipment. There is nowhere in the European standard you can look up and find, OK, I want to build a Zombot. How do I do that? Or I want to build a blue whale. How do I do that? Doesn't exist. The standards equipment are a house, sandbox, swings, slides, cableways, carousels, and seesaws. That's it. Oh, and trampolines. That's it. Those are the standard pieces of equipment. That doesn't mean that's the only thing th that we can build and design. And you can build everything together in one, as long as you know what's in the standard. OK? Any questions so far? Yeah? The balls from the light look like they don't have any hollow space. These balls? Yeah. That's because they are part of a combined play. So every piece of equipment, I told you before, has to have a falling space of uh, 150 centimeters. Except if the intended play is to jump from one to the other as a, as a, as a part of a balancing act or as a part of a, uh, we call it a, a, a Tarzan track in Denmark. You can build close to each other, but you have to make sure that even one of the small children can go all the way across. 
then they are allowed to be inside each other's holy place if they are part of an intended play. Uh, is there a standard for this jumping space? Well, I... Uh, it's the same question every sim single time. No, there isn't. We tried... I'm in the, I'm in the European uh, uh, Council for the Safety of, of, of Children, and we tried <laughs> several years ago to get a maximum distance from edge to edge, and Germany wanted it to be 64 and a half centimeters, and everybody said yay, except for the Belgians and the French, because the Germans came up with it. <laughs> so we couldn't, we couldn't, yeah, it's, it's, po it's politics. <laughs> yeah, it is politics. So no, we, when, when the designers call us, we go, yeah, keep it below 50, you'll be fine. But uh, there's nowhere in the standard that says that a kid can straddle this or jump. But half, 50 centimeters from edge to edge is maximum, I think. That's what we tell our clients. Because if it's longer and they try to straddle and then they flip, guess what happens to the face? And then they break a nose and teeth. We're fine. Yeah. During the one quick interview, uh, during the week with you up in Denmark, I think there was a several times that came up <coughs> the notion of common sense. Yeah. So I think yeah. when you can't find the actual answer for what you're looking for, yeah, use your common sense. Yeah. But I also try to explain to people my common sense isn't necessarily the same as your common sense or your common sense. <laughs> but use common sense. That's why I always start these things with it's not brain surgery and it's not rocket science. It's common sense, it's logic. Okay, any more questions? No? I must be really good at this then. No? Okay. We have been walking around, driving around, looking at some of your playgrounds uh, within the city. And one of the first, or one of the most reoccurring deviations to the standard that I have seen are the surfacing materials or lack of. Um, how do I put this gently? <laughs> it's not enough. Is that fine? Yeah. yeah. What percentage of the playground would you need to test these things? Oh, how many percent? <laughs> these many. Yeah. yeah. Okay, but we saw four. Yeah, we saw we saw four. <laughs> and and and uh, was it in the Hobbit? He said, "You shall not pass." Yeah. Yeah. No, they w no, they wouldn't. Not not not according to the standard. But I mean. Usually when we come and inspect a playground for the first time, it can be an old playground, we find a lot of deviations, a lot of faults, a lot of mistakes. And then we do a report and it's 80 pages, 600 pictures, and we write, oh, this is wrong and that is wrong. And, th and then when the customer gets it, they call us and do, what am I gonna do? And we go, okay, so how old is the playground? Well, it was put here in 1986. Okay, how many deaths? Uh, none. Okay, so how many times has the ambulance been at your institution? Never. Okay. So your playground is not more dangerous today than it was yesterday, just because I told you it does not conform to the standard. Okay? So we can, we can have a playground that does not conform, but is still safe. And we can have a, a playground that conforms but looks extremely not safe. Okay? But in the case of Istanbul, I think this issue, um, I, as far as I know, uh, please com correct me if I'm wrong, we do have the same code. We have translated it into Turkish, so yep. this EN 1176 is translated at, as TS 1176, and we have it. So it's, I think, a little bit up to all of us to be interested in the content and also to demand from the clients that we work with that they be interested in the content 
And we have been walking around with the two municipalities today, with Maltepe and Sariar, and we looked at some of their playgrounds, and some of them had serious pro like uh, serious head entrapment problems, and definitely the flooring wasn't the correct surfacing. But they also don't know. I mean, we realize that, especially for the flooring, they know it's not adequate, but they don't know what it means not to be adequate. No. So that if they don't know it's broken, why should they fix it? If you don't know that it's wrong, you would never ever fix it. I mean, we had the same issue um, in also, like they have one of the municipalities has an amazing network of actually staff that goes and inspects, not inspects, but they look at the playgrounds every day. Yeah, so they have a, about 150 playgrounds. They have six people who, who go, go around and check the playgrounds every day, more or less on a daily day basis, not if daily, every other day. So actually, it's not that they don't have the manpower to inspect, like to do this. They they just don't know. So I, it's just no. a matter of not knowing, and and that's I think the yeah. Yeah, and it is a matter of training. Yeah, and it's not a long training. It's just a five day or three day training. Yeah. So this is what we are hoping to now work with the municipalities is to say, okay, let's organize this training for you. Let's just get it over with. It's not that complicated. Yeah, I'll come back. And the idea would be really to, also from us on the designer side, to, to own this knowledge and to, I mean, we had, I don't know Arzu, if you remember, Elgar was here last year around this time. And I kept asking Elgar, so what's the safety? How do you deal with the safety? And he kept saying, you know, just, just read the freaking thing. It's not that complicated. Just read this uh, 1176. And it's we only couldn't 250 some pages. I mean, yeah, we if, we if, if, if you read it, you'll get the gist of what's important and what's not. I mean, some of it is not that important, but all of the entrapments and all the fa falling heights and the surface demands, they are important because it's, it's more rare that children or the serious accidents occur on the equipment. The most serious accidents happen when they land on the surface. And the surface has nothing to do with broken arms or legs. It has only to do with everything from here on and up. Well, actually, from here on and up. <laughs> it's the brain and the skull. That's it. So when we test surfacing, we don't care about arms or legs. We do, we do, uh, we have a, we have a, not an actual baby head, but we have a head or we have a, a probe shaped like half a head that we drop. 12 times to get a result and we can if we test a, a surface we can tell you which height this surface is approved for which falling height and the surfacing we've seen is is way too hard on the four playgrounds we've seen so but again if you don't know you're doing something wrong you can't fix it so it it is a matter of training matter of educating people Okay, questions for the surfacing? Want to more about surfacing? Uh, maybe let's talk about the sand and the uh, cobblestones, uh, not cobblestones, uh, of course, the other stones, can't remember the name, pebble stones. There the you pebble go. stones and the sand and the not the cobblestones? Well, the pro well, if you use sand, I think you would have the same problem here as we have in Denmark. Cats love sand. Uh, and dogs do too. Uh, and the problem with that is that children also love sand. And the combination cat, dog, two-year-old who puts everything in his mouth, <coughs> not a good combo. But the, the animal droppings mentioned in the standard are cat, hare, uh, rabbit, and fox. Those are the only ones. Because they, their uh, uh, droppings have a parasite in them called toxoplasmosis, which can give birth defects in pregnant women. Dog, sh uh, dog droppings, <laughs> I was close. Dog droppings are just really, really uh, annoying, yeah. And they stink. But cat droppings, hair and fox, no go on the playground. 
okay? And if you use sand or uh, pe uh, pe pebble stones, do you call them pebble stones? Yeah. You need to have the correct thickness. And you need to maintain your gravel or your sand, which means you have to rake through it once in a while to loosen it up. Because when, when they walk or run in it, they will stomp it together. It will get hard. About four to five centimeters below the surface, there will be a crust of about four centimeters, which is too hard for the first kid to fall on. All the other kids will be fine because the first kid will break it, but it will also break their skull. So you need to maintain, if you use sand or gravel, you need to maintain it. Keep it clean, no glass, no uh, broken bottles or, or anything. In the standard, they, they, mention, they mention razor blades, used needles, so new needles are fine, used needles and broken bottles. You need to remove that every single day. If you have gravel and sand, it's, it could be difficult to see it unless you rake it through. When using the rubber material, it's easily seen because it's on the surface and it's cleanable. It's more expensive though, way more expensive. How many, like what's the ratio of playgrounds in Denmark uh, sent to uh, EPDM? 70 sand, 30 EPDM. But it's, it's, we're going the other way now. Yeah, but the EPDM industry is also pushing it the other way. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. But they can prove that it's a good product, so. <laughs> because so the sand people are not working as hard. No, the sand people, they, they don't care because th if they don't sell their sand to the playgrounds, they just sell it to a contractor somewhere. They, they'll sell all their sand, the all the sand they can or will. But the rubber industry is also pushing for it. Plus, the sales people, Denmark, they could sell horses or used cars as well because they can sell anything they want. And they do it from a design point of view. They never use the EPDM as a safety uh, uh, issue. They use it as a design because you can get, you can get your logo in it or if you, one of your kids has a drawing, we can put that in there. And, and they do the <laughs> They're really good at this, by the way. Some of them are even doing the um, so, but they, and, and of course, from a maintenance issue as well. They never use the safety issue as a selling point. They do design and maintenance. Because it's maintenance free. Who doesn't want a maintenance free playground? So we just put it in there and forget about it the next 30, 40 years. Is that true? 30, no, 40? <laughs> no. That does never happen. Yeah. <laughs> because the, the EPDM, if there's sand, somewhere near, there's a sandbox and there's EPDM around. They will put the sand out into the EPDM. We did a testing in, in, in Denmark on a 11 year old EPDM surface with sand. It was, a, it was a, a walking path, but with 60 millimeter EPDM because there were also climbing structures. Uh, and there but there was sand on both sides and it felt really hard walking on it. So we tested it before they cleaned it and then we tested it after. And we can document uh, improvement by cleaning it. But they clean it with soap and they suck all the sand out and pressure wash and everything. So it can be cleaned. Plus in the winter, if it gets uh, slippery, you can salt it, you put salt on it. Not a problem here, I would imagine. No, no. <laughs> So questions about surfacing? I want to tell you one thing first before we go on. If you use rubber surfacing, the surfacing system is in two parts. There is a base layer and there is a top layer. The top layer is always 15 millimeters. And the top layer of 15 millimeters gives you zero centimeters of falling height. Okay, you might as well use concrete and paint it, as long as you paint it with a soft paint. <laughs> so if you use rubber, you use a base layer first, 
and then you put the EPDM on top. The base layer is usually made out of old tires or uh, SBR rubber of some sorts, and then you put the EPDM on top. The EPDM is cosmetic. That's it. Desi that's the design part of it. The impact attenuation is in the base layer, the lowest part. So if, if we have, for instance, a falling height of uh, one and a half meter, which is about here, you need 45 millimeters of base layer and 15 millimeters of EPDM to pass a test. So 15 millimeters of EPDM isn't enough. Yeah. What? Depending on the supply. Yeah, some of them will require 50 or 60 millimeters base. Depends on what kind of product it is. But we're talking 50, 60 millimeters for a falling height of a meter 50. And if we go all the way up to, to uh, a falling height of max, three meters, you'll need 130 millimeter of EPDM or only 15 millimeters of EPDM and the rest of it should be the base layer. So the rubber surfacing is in two parts. The base layer, which is the impact attenuation, and then the design part, the cosmetic on top. But for example, we have, we're looking at that um, bear. Yeah. And you can't fall from top of that. Where, where would we, for example, if we go back to that slide, where would we need the, uh, the thick EPDM layer? Nowhere around here. Here, you can climb up that hole. You can climb up there. So here, that you would need the thick layer. And then out here, at the end of the slide, you would need a thick layer. Not that thick, though. I mean, there's a, yeah, there's a, behind the, dra or the dragon, you can climb the dragon all the way on top of that his head. That's three meters up, by the way. You'll need the thick layer all around. So as designers also, we can, if we are aware of this um, thick layer that we need and that we need to insist on, we also should be aware that we don't need to insist on that everywhere. No. So it's not the entire, pl it's only, well, if, if we can do, the, we can do the, the calculation because if you have a play equipment with a falling height of up to 150 centimeters, you need a falling space of 150 centimeters. But if you go above 150, you measure your falling height, and then you take two-thirds of that, and you add 50 centimeters. So impact attenuating surfacing and falling space will always be between 150 and 250. Because you're not allowed to fall more than three meters, and two-thirds of three meters, last time I was in school, way back when, was two meters, plus 50 centimeters. So the falling space will always be between 150 and 250. Okay? Yep. There is a slide that you saw. Yeah, with us. the wood chips. Yes, with the wood chips. Uh, if it's if it's engineered wood chips, yeah. because you can buy, they're really expensive. They make them the same way as everybody else, but they're engineered. <laughs> if you use engineered wood chips. You can go into table four in the standard and it will tell you if you put 10 centimeters plus 10, you have a falling height of one meter. And if you put 20 centimeters plus 10, you have a falling height of two meters. Can anyone imagine the thickness of engineered wood chips from a falling height of three meters? If we go 10, 20, we go 30. So if you put engineered wood chips, 30 centimeters plus 10 for displacement, you will have a falling height of three meters. And the base of it should be like a natural, like Could be turf? concrete, could be concrete, could yeah, could be asphalt, because the, the uh, surfacing uh, acts on its own and is tested by itself on a dead surface. Also about this rubber, like loose rubber, like they, there is so a product like loose rubber, chipped rubbers. Yeah, but they glue them together. They glue them together? Yes. Not they, loose. they mix it with glue and then they put it out. So it looks like wood chips and it looks like 
loose material. And basically, what it is, is it like EPDM then, or exactly? Okay. But it's but it's not EP, EP. Well, no, but yeah. <laughs> EPDM is fake because EPDM is industrially manufactured and SBR is, is natural rubber. But they're also, they're vulcanized and... But yeah, the, the, the, the wood chips lookalikes is also a rubber material and they mix it with glue. And at the base, then you have to like do it as what you do in EPDM, like you make this safe... If you use the wood chips lookalike rubber, that's only one system. That's a one part system. But it's not as strong as the other one. And EPDM doesn't burn, but SBR rubber burns really, really nice. Okay. And it goes yeah. <laughs> So we don't use it. Yeah, yeah, well no. yeah, you can use it. It do doesn't burn that fast, but it burns really, really well. And if, if, you, use, if you use 15 centimeters of, of the, the rubber wood chips, you have a falling height of three meters. And they are not as expensive as the other one, but they're not as durable either. And plus, they're all black. They paint them, they mix them with paint, so they look like wood chips. But when the kids run around on it, it tears the paint off, so it, everything turns black. Plus, the cheaper the EPDM, the less color you get in it. So it, it might look really beautiful on, on day one, but after two years in the sun, it's all gray. So the cheaper the material, the lower the quality, like everything else. Thank you. Move to the next one. I can try. Yeah, th these are actual wood chips. And if you go, if you go to, to the US, you're only allowed to use EPDM or engineered wood chips. If you use wood chips that are not certifi certified as engineered, they are just wood chips. Yeah. Uh, our options for flooring. You yep. were mentioning for sand, EPDM or SBR, and wood chips and what else? The Gravel, uh, pebble stones. Pebble stones, that's yeah. it. Yeah, but only, yeah, but only, only where there is risk of a fall. Yes. Like grass, grass is fine up till about a meter. Okay. But it has to be grass. Okay. Concrete is fine until 60 centimeters of falling height. Okay. Yeah, you mean the asphalt and the uh, stone as well under 60 centimeters? Yeah. You were saying? Yes. Okay. As long as it's even. Even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they should be able to fall all the way. The head shouldn't stop mm -hmm. halfway. Okay, thank you. Anyone? No one? Not a one? Uh, there is one more slide, no? No, no, no, no. This is only slide 15 of 192. <laughs> yeah. So, moving on to maintenance. Designing, selling, and installing, and getting the mayor to open a playground is all fine, wonderful, beautiful. But then we forget about it. Then we just leave it. Maintenance is a, the biggest part of the mistakes that we get in Europe, or the accidents. Primarily, it's the surfacing. As you can see over here, we get, we get uh, frost and snow and ice in Denmark. So when this freezes, it will be as hard as concrete. If they fall from up here, they will break their neck or break uh, their skull. So this is not okay. So when it rains, even if it rains heavily, the water should be drained away everywhere on a playground. As you can see here, this, this has been here for quite some time and it's rotting. That's rotting. And if, if, if the owner does his or her um, monthly or, or annually or some kind of regular inspection, 
they would have seen this and that and this and this that's opened up here. They would have seen that. And there's the, the, the first part we do when we build a playground is you should assign responsibility for the playground to someone. Person A is now in charge of making sure that we get it inspected and we get it maintained. There you go. Good news, we realize in Istanbul this is actually working. It is, <laughs> it is. Because there's a formalized responsibility and there's a formalized chain of command in Istanbul. We found out yesterday. In one, at least in one of the I municipalities. Mean we, we didn't yeah. ask the other ones. I mean, we yeah, and they had, they had 150 playgrounds. In, and, and I told them afterwards, if I, if I would have asked that question in, in Denmark, I look in the crowd and go, so which one of you is in charge of all the playgrounds? Everybody would be going, it's, it's not me. It's but they all went, <laughs> and she went, that's me. So that works. There's a formalized, formally placed responsibility for the playgrounds in Istanbul or in that municipality. And that works. And then you need to put the playground into your planning of inspections and maintenance and cleaning and repairing and all of that. Because designing and selling and cutting the red ribbon, yay. But we're not done. Okay? So maintenance, big issue. Um, I started my first business in 2006, and I was all by myself until 2012. 2012, I hired two engineers. Is any one of you an engineer? Architects, I love working with architects. Engineers, <laughs> not so much. So the first time I, I trained them for a week before we went out and then we spent three months working on, on, uh, on uh, 600 different playgrounds. They saw a lot of these pictures in my computer. And they started talking about, I wonder if Einar has some sort of weird fetish. Because this is sand and those are cat droppings. This was a huge problem in Denmark in the 2008, 9, 10. And I have no idea why. It's, it's not anymore, but those three or four years, we had cat droppings everywhere, in every single sandbox we saw. I have a million pictures of cat droppings. So, no cat dropping. Plus, if you use rubber as impact attenuation. You don't have to check that for cat droppings or broken glass or anything. But that does not mean we should not build sandboxes. Sand sandboxes are important. Sandboxes are a big part of small children's creative process. So we need the sandboxes. This is not under design or safety or anything. This is under maintenance, which means we need somebody to go and check these sandboxes regularly to make sure that they're clean. We, get, we usually get the call, somebody told me we need to uh, exchange the sand in our sandboxes once a year. Not true. When it's dirty, change it, clean it. Just do something. Yeah. Do you put covers between the roofs? Yeah, we put nets. Nets with small masks in them. Not the big ones, because the cats will just walk into them anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We the, the most of the uh, sandboxes get sold with a net, but parents never put the nets on when they're done. When their children are done, they just leave, and then they come back and it's full of cat droppings. And they yell and they call the municipality and say, "You guys suck." It's their fault. They didn't put the net back on. You have to put in the sand. Oh yeah. You can put a lot of chemicals in the sand. They're poisonous to children, but they will keep the cats away. Okay. I'm, I'm not in that world. No, no. No, it doesn't work. Uh, um, uh, Densen, which is a Danish uh, a sand company, that's re they're really good at making all kinds of sand products. 
they tried, they've, they've invented some kind of sand that, uh, uh, that you put between tiles outside and the uh, sideway, uh, sidewalk that doesn't uh, let weed grow in it. They tried to put that in a sandbox. Cats loved it. Uh, they tried to uh, do something else with it, some chemical and rounding of it and the size and the shape of it. Cats really love that one. So I'd, I have no idea. Yeah, pl but you know, I have a cat. There's a product called uh, Cataway. Yeah, my cat loves it. Yeah, it's, it's, like, it's like a drug to him. So I don't know. Use a net, use a lid, but do the sandboxes. I guarantee you my household is not a normal household. I grew up on the Faroe Islands where, where as a two-year-old, I was told to go up play in the river or down beside the boats on the docks. And my wife grew up in America where she got packed into cotton and, and plastic wrap and everything because everything was dangerous. Could you can you imagine what happened the first time one of my kids cut their finger? She almost called an ambulance. <laughs> like, yeah. We're, we're, we're this different. <laughs> yeah. 23 years this Saturday, so <laughs> we must be doing something right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. This is the last slide, is it? No. No? No. Oh, I know, that's true. That is true. Yeah. yeah. So, are we... This talks about not everything having to be heroic. Yeah. Yes, but this looks to an adult like oh, there's no play value, there's nothing in it, there's no challenge, no nothing. This is actually quite challenging for small children. And the play value is enormous because they can, they can choose different routes around. There are different heights, different distances between the, the different stones. So it's actually very motor skills challenging for the kids. And they love those. Plus, every time you put in a new playground, somebody will fall. Somebody will break something or sprain an ankle or, or do something. Because they need to figure out how does this playground work. Oh, you could do, oh yeah, go nuts. Yeah, but then they take it away from you. Yeah. Maybe it's just a cat. No, there, there's two more slides. No, no, no, no, no, no. There, there's more, more. Wow, so funny. Um. The translator is tired of me. She wants me to quit. <laughs> Let's see if there's any questions in the meanwhile. Well, hey, you open the lid and, uh, yeah. Uh, one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The sandwich playgrounds or the playgrounds in general in Turkey yeah. covers a lot of mishmash of colors yeah. that would drive um, aut autistic kids crazy. Do you see that as a safety concern? <laughs> I mean, is there a protocol? No. No. Okay. But you're right. They would drive an autistic kid crazy. Yeah. Okay. And I've seen some of the playgrounds that <laughs> would drive an OCD kid crazy as well. But no, there's no, there's no color protocol. Except, well, if you go to Norway, you're not allowed to have stainless steel anywhere uh, that they can touch, because in Norway it gets really, really cold. Oh. Not because it gets hot. It, it gets cold. They get stuck. Have you seen Dumb and Dumber where they go the uh, and through the, yeah? Norwegian kids do that apparently. So no stainless steel in Norway. Um, but no, that's, that, that's the only country I know of that has a restrictive, well it's not a coloring, but they have stainless steel, no. And plus in Norway, you're not allowed to have rocks or concrete in your falling space. Even though you're below 60. So, and 
and there we go. This is about the falling height. Yeah. So this is about a meter 50, meter 60 maybe high. Does anyone know what the falling height of that sphere is? What? Could be. It's not. <laughs> because falling heights are measured from the topmost intended body support vertically to the surface below. You can't measure vertically from the top of a sphere. So if you have a sphere or you have an incline, they will not fall. They will tumble or slide. So that sphere has no <coughs> falling height at all. And even though they put in EPDM, rubber surfacing, that's fine, that's logic because we know they will fall. But if they didn't put it in, I couldn't, from a standards point of view, go and say you need impact attenuating surfacing because they don't. There's no falling height from a sphere. It's the same if you have a climbing wall that's totally vertical, you have a falling height. But if you tilt it and they climb on, on this side, no falling height. Small tricks. Yeah. Common sense? Small tricks, yeah, common sense. Yeah, use your common because, sense. Because common sense dictates that, of course, you put impact attenuating surfacing because if they fall, they will get hurt. But they'll be fine. Kids will be fine. We grew up fine, or most of you did. What? We have a few, we have a, f yeah. But, yeah, but, yeah, but if, we, we, there are a few angles mentioned in the standard. The first one is, 38. A ramp is an incline of 38. That's a ramp. Fine, done. <laughs> Away with that. Then the next part is pieces of equipment allowed inside the falling space. I kept telling you nothing inside the falling space because we don't want them to hit anything. The one thing allowed inside the falling space is pieces of the equipment with an inclination of more than 60 degrees because that will only give a slight touch on the way down. So if you go bel below 60, you glide. But above 60, it's more of a fall, but they will slide or tumble. But you the closer you get to 90, the closer you get to an actual fall. So common sense, again, again. But there's no angle because if you go to 90 it's a free fall and if you go to 89 it's not but yeah so we use we usually tell them go if you go below 60 you're fine so okay more questions there you go that one and where's the other one? one right there. That one. This goes really well. Is it in a sleep mode? They're there. These stones are manufactured at a concrete production plant. These are not. Same rules. If we put them in a place where we expect kids to play with them, they need to abide by the same rules. Okay? So one is an artist that uses these rocks, put them in place, puts concrete or rubber or what, what she wants wanted to use. And the other one was a designer, designed the, the, the stones, got them produced and put in place.
same rules. Okay? So this one is also here to say it doesn't have to be that expensive either. No. You can use your imagination. Any more questions? This was the last slide. Uh, so if we want to have a conversation, um, we still have some time. Well, what I understand is you just saw in Turkey the playgrounds uh, which were like on public space. Yeah. But we are designing a lot, like in community, like these gated communities, and yeah. they are like they are like wanted as an attraction point for selling a house or a space. So I think, I don't know, maybe next time at your visit, yeah. maybe you would be interested seeing some because about surfacing and about the equipment, a lot of um, debates are going on like this budget issue. Yeah, I know. So as far as you, you push as a designer that the safety rules and things, but at the end it can come down to money and then it would be like, okay, what can happen the worst? And how do we deal with this? My first question would be, how much does a child cost? Anyone? Depends on the, yeah, it depends on if it's mine or yours or, yeah. You can take that to the people doing the budget. If they want to save 30,000 lira or, or something, on the surfacing, whose kid is going to do the first drop then? Yeah. Uh, also, it's not only the surfacing, it's about the equipment also. You know, if you go for like a brand that is secure, then it comes down to, oh, in Turkey we can manufacture this. It's really easy. They can do the replica. You know, and you can, you can do whatever you want as long as you focus on motor skills development first and safety afterwards. You don't have to buy the expensive brands be just because they're sold in the billions around the world. You can do your own or you can buy, but remember, the cheaper it is, the lower the quality and the lower the safety issue. I think it's important to start with the public sector. Uh, and we, we uh, I think Einar is available uh, Any time, I think that's what we got him to come here for the first time, but uh, it's not meant to be the last time. Um, but I think we need to uh, uh, get the standard to be taken seriously first at the public institution level, uh, and hopefully also try to figure out a system where independent inspection is a part of the process. So we build it into our uh, as designers, our fees, that there should be an independent inspection. And it doesn't cost millions, it's not so complicated to get an independent inspection. Uh, one, once it gets, I mean, it's really not unaffordable. So I think that's, that's one thing that we could pu push for. Because the more we say, it doesn't matter. It needs to come from another authority that is independent and is following a document that the Turkish state also buys into. We learned today also that the municipalities, when they bid out drawings, they need to demand this TS-1176. So we can also follow up if the producer really has that certificate or not. I mean, part of it is a learning process that we will all go through, I think. And I it's just that it's, it's actually, for us as designers, we find it comp found it completely liberating to know that it's, it's not so complicated, that you can do things and you can convince people that it's uh, that you know it's safe, especially the 60 centimeter rule because we are interested in young children, so it's the, um, it's, it's the babies and the toddlers that they can fall from 60 centimeters. It's, and you can, you can design a lot, I mean, that's an interesting thing. The one that you took photos of, it's all kind of works from the 60 centimeter rule and that once you make something difficult to access, then, then it is also by code that you don't have to worry about the small children, then you can be more free, you can design more, yeah. more things that have more complexity to it, to it, and that's totally fine too. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's good to know this document, first us, and then get the municipalities to take it seriously, 
and I, I think we will we will um, achieve some results with that. So we're really looking forward to working. And anyone who is interested, who wants to get the training and so forth, we hope to organize a training session with the municipality in the fall. Uh, for them, we will try to figure out the way, way that the staff, of course, gets trained for free. But if there's any designers here who want to be a part of that too, I'm sure we were going to get ma make sure that we can accommodate a couple people also. So please be in touch with us if you want to go through the training. Uh, we'll figure out how to organize it. Any more questions? Ha, evet, tabii Türkçe de olabilir sorular. İngilizce olmak zorunda değil. Şey yapabiliriz. Apart from our uh, moral concerns, what kind of legal concerns should we have? For example, did you go to court as an expert? I'm an expert witness, yes. Are there any designers who got imprisoned? because of their mistakes? No, but one should be the first one, right? No, <laughs> um, in, in, in, the, in the European Union, it's the owner's responsibility to make sure that they have the correct level of safety on all of their playgrounds. If something happens, well, we had, we had a, a 31-year-old woman die uh, this Saturday because a swing set fell on her and broke her skull, so she died instantly. Um, it is the owner's responsibility, even though it may have been installed incorrectly or uh, been broken or sawn over, vandalized or anything. It's still the owner's responsibility. It's always the owner. Even though I come and say everything is hunky-dory, it is the owner's responsibility to make sure that everything is as it's supposed to be. Yeah. What? Norway does it differently. Yeah. Sorry. Which is not part of the EU. But yeah. Norway is not part of the EU. But let's go into that story with the swing set. Um, what happened and who, who, who has contributed to this issue at the end? To the accident? Yeah. My point of view? Yeah. The installer. As the expert witness. Yeah. The installer. What but I haven't do? I haven't checked it yet. I'm gonna check it tomorrow when I get a back get back. With the with the Danish police. The the swing set were put in place last September. So And what did they do wrong? Well according to the media? According to the media, it wasn't it wasn't uh, uh, installed correctly because it was just put loose, and then sand or gravel around it, so it worked its way up when they were swinging. According to the media, I haven't I haven't inspected it yet. I haven't seen it. Most of the, most of the swings, is, you know, they have this connection thing that they lift it up and come down. Yeah. Do you consider those? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I saw a little girl on one of those swings yesterday, and she kept falling out of it and, and getting entangled in the, in the, because the seats are so wide, and when they sit in it, they go like this, yeah, and then they, and then, yeah, and then the seat, the seat tilts, so they fall out. What's wrong with a regular tire or a regular swing? Those swings are for, they're not even for infants or not even for small children because they are huge. You could get an, um, you could get an average American in there. Okay? Yeah. Yeah, this tape definitely not end on the internet. So. What are the mistakes of the designers you observe most? The lack of falling space and the overlap of, of falling spaces that are, that are not allowed to overlap. Mm. So missing falling space, too short distances, and overlap. That's, yeah, yeah, we found a really good one. Mm -hmm. But that, that is the uh, primary, and, and well, today also we saw uh, head entrapments 
in the tower. Yeah, that's a design point because it was a it was a, a cosmetic detail. So it can go from uh, too short falling space to uh, head entrapment. Okay. And one more question. Yeah. Uh, the what is bothering me uh, about this balustrade issue when we are designing the playgrounds? Yeah. Uh, you showed a picture to us the the more uh, traditional one and yeah. the cylinder with the yeah. robot. Yeah. So in the in the cylinder one, we didn't have the balustrade at all, even on the 90 degree part, where we can fall like this. Uh, yeah. So do you have or do we have any uh, limits or any rules for that? For example, we don't have any balustrade at all in this one. Oh, uh, the barrier. Yeah, barrier. Um, yes. If it's easily accessible, you need a full barrier from the falling height, 60 centimeters, mm -hmm. and all the way up. If it's not easily accessible, you need a full barrier from two meters and up. Okay. From one meter to two meters, you need a guardrail, unless it's a climbing structure. And a climbing structure is defined by you need three points of contact to maneuver it. So enable to move your entire weight on this structure. You need three points of contact, whereof, this is true, one of them should be a hand. Mm. That's what it says. Okay. This is not that high. I'm 172 <laughs> on a good day. <laughs> and I'm taller than he is. So this isn't that high. But from a design point of view, what would a barrel look like with a barrier around it? What would that be? How would that look from a design point of view? Mm -hmm. So. Yes, it is a design problem for it us. Is, it is. It yes. is. Yeah, it is yeah, a design problem because we are. Uh, we don't want to put anything like this no. inside of us, but we are feeling like we should. Yeah, you need you need a barrier on a platform. A platform is designed as a raised sur or is defined as a raised surface, where one or more can stand without holding on to anything. So if you curve it give it some inclination or something okay. you move away from the platform definition mm -hmm. yeah okay. that's a barrel let's call it a barrel that's not a platform yeah okay thank you so plus the the y you saw the blue whale earlier yeah. there are no barriers on top of the whale either yeah. it goes like this okay let's take one last question and then we will have some time we can ask um, five questions I know we'll be here. Any any last questions? Okay. Thank you so much. As always, it was super liberating to know all this. Hopefully, took a, that took an hour and a half. I was what was supposed to do, so we're on time. Uh, again, um, I know we'll be coming back, probably around November. We haven't really scheduled it yet. I mean, I'm. I'm imagining we have to get them back because we need all this training, at, at least at the municipal level. Uh, and if there's any other per persons, companies that are interested, uh, so we can work towards how to organize that also, uh, let us know. And we're happy to, to figure this, help figure this out. And we can talk now. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Einar.